And we are live on Facebook. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's my great privilege and honor today to have our LD1 Assemblyman Republican Eric Simonson join me today. Eric, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, JR. It's uh, always great to uh, see you and uh, talk to you. And uh, last week, I had the privilege of speaking to uh, Senator Testa and your fellow Assemblyman McClellan. And uh, I was very uh, struck, but not surprised about how well um, you work. And of course, you're one third of that team, Testa. It's really amazing how well uh, you gentlemen get along and you really do enjoy each other's company. And you really are, can, really are a team, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's... It's the one two punch you have you have Senator Testa in the Senate who obviously yeah. has uh, is is all for voicing his opinion as we've seen over the last two years and he's done an excellent job and then uh, yes, and that, that's putting him mildly you know that um yeah and, <laughs> that is putting him mildly that's what he said he was going to do when he got there and he did it so god bless him yep. and and yes. and then you have uh Antoine and I in the assembly so um it's been a great working relationship. The fact that we have two offices, you know, a lot of the other legislatures only uh, legislators only have one. So we have one in Vineland and one in Cape May Courthouse. We have both sides of legislative district one covered for our constituents. And that's, it's been huge. We have a great staff and we share a lot of the staff and we're able to do twice as much work for our constituents. And that's why they voted for us and put us in office. That's right. And uh, of course, who would have thought that you would have had all of the um, real trials and tribulations in your first two years in the assembly uh, right away with the uh, COVID lockdowns and uh, economic uh, um, really just a terrible, terrible um, tragedy that's happened in New Jersey. And of course, you and your uh, fellow assemblyman and Senator Testa have done a great job in representing the citizens of LD1. I just wanted to share with the, the audience very quickly, uh, Assemblyman, your, uh, your page, um, which is a really, really great page. And I would recommend people um, go to this and uh, view the page. And they can see it at the NJAssemblyGOP.com, Assemblyman. Um, and it's, of course, your page, Eric Simonson. And what many people don't realize, Assemblyman, is that um, you're actually a, a you're an athletic director and you've been involved with, in educational administration for quite some time uh, at Lower Cape May Regional High School. And yes. I wanted to ask, yes. and I wanted to ask you, uh, Assembly, because you're uniquely qualified in this regard, is we know of the economic devastation and impact that the COVID-19 lockdowns had, which we believe were uh, entirely unconstitutional. But tell us about the, the, the physiological and the psychological impact that the lockdowns had on the students and those participating in athletics. Well, it was, you know, like you just said, it, it was an interesting time for everybody. But we, and let me start by saying, my, I have a great staff here, just like in LD1. And um, between the, uh, the uh, athletic trainer, myself, and the nurse, um, obviously everybody working together and the coach I mean we had uh, you know along with temperature checks and the masks and we had to do uh, fill out COVID forms daily if a kid came to practice they couldn't practice until they we had an online system where they could uh, do a COVID questionnaire just like you do when you go into a doctor's office um, and, and you know our coaches were very instrumental in you know having minimal um really any minimal issues uh we got through every season you know i can't say that for every school cape me county schools and I, most of the cumberland county schools uh down this way really our legislative district one uh area were fortunate but, but um you know it was a lot of extra work put on and then you know you need you need the coaches to follow the protocols and, and they did and it's um you know, like I said, we were blessed that we got through all of our seasons unscathed. I was even able to uh, I, I take care of the junior high school as well. We had all of our middle school sports and we were the only only um, middle school in the Cape Atlantic League uh, that had all their 
school sports for the fall anyway. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of extra work, you know, but, but you're right. I mean, the, the best way, you, you know, everybody knows that, you know, mentally as well as physically getting kids mm-hmm. involved in activities, whether it's sports or something else after school, um, a lot of that was, was hindered by, by the pandemic. And, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult. Busing is a huge issue, still is. But you had to space kids out on the bus. So um, what normally took one bus would take two, and obviously exponentially down the line. So it was difficult to, uh, to get students from one place to another, whether it's, it was, in, you know, an, an arts or, or uh, activity or, you know, after school activities or sports. So I definitely hindered, hindered our kids. Like I said, we were fortunate enough to keep, um, you know, a good number of them occupied and involved in athletics and activities. So we, we were, ha- we were, like I said, we're very thankful for that. And in your estimation of Solomon, do you think that the governor should have taken more uh, geographical considerations involved as opposed to imposing a uh, broad, blank, broad blanket approach to uh, the lockdowns throughout the state. I mean, obviously what goes on in Lower Township and Cape May County and Cumberland is very, very different than what happens up in Hudson County or up in Middlesex County. Do you think that the uh, governor um, should have given more, um, look for more input from men like yourself and Antoine and State Senator Tusta? Well, look, I, I'll give you a quick analogy. As I was a special needs teacher for 18 years, um, you know, working at a, a district with all uh, kids with different varying disabilities. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, teach one lesson for all those kids. It's, it's yeah. not one size fits all. We've said that even for the regular population in a public school, um, it's not one size fits all. That's why you have AP classes, which are advanced proficient, and you have college bound classes and you have remedial classes because not every kid learns at the same level. And, and it pretty much goes like that uh, with, with the pandemic. I mean, our numbers were much lower down here. Um, our way of life down here, you're out in the fresh air a lot more, obviously with the seashore and the bay side. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have boardwalks. There's a lot of uh, recreational. There's parks uh, here in Cape May County. There's so many areas up in Cumberland and even our little sliver of Atlantic County that we cover that that you can get outdoors and do things. And, um, you know, it, it, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a little, it, it was kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, disheartening to see that, mm-hmm. you know, you can treat us the same as, as the inner city up in maybe a Patterson or a Newark. Um, and, you know, it, it didn't help them either. I'm sure. I mean, it, there, there's, like I said, there's, there's no, um, one size fits all there definitely isn't and we clearly saw that uh, phil murphy didn't uh, take that into consideration and i've argued assemblyman that um indeed the state senate president isn't the second most powerful person in new jersey government government but i would say that uh, judith precicelli of the uh, department of health (laughs) had a a lot more influence on uh, what was going on with the lockdowns in new jersey than uh, than anyone else and of course, she Absolutely. was an appointment. She was an appointee. Uh, she was appointed by Phil Murphy back in 2018. But uh, don't you think that it's important now as we move forward that the legislative body uh, reestablishes its authority as the sole legislator? You know, these executive orders have the um, have the force of law. And of course, he's uh, Murphy has been given these unprecedented powers, which really, if we go back into history, goes back to FDR. Uh, and in his inaugural speech and his uh, in his first four years as president starting in 1933 and giving expansive executive powers to what many term as war on a, a specific uh, crisis. And of course, uh, a war is very, very different, an actual war very different than, than a supposed health crisis. But we see these unprecedented expansive powers and don't you think that the legislative body number one needs to determine and uh, define exactly what constitutes a health crisis or a health emergency and then number two what can be done to effectively restrict the power uh, of the executive order uh, in what we consider what phil murphy did was a suspension of constitutional rights and freedom of assembly 
freedom of religious expression and the New Jersey Constitution, right of the people to obtain, possess, and protect their property, which is the money in their pocket, in their account, or their business. Well, oh, and well, let's go back to the first thing you said. I mean, with, with FDR, I mean, that was wartime, you're right, but his powers eventually expired. Um, yep. Ours, you know, our governors did not. They just kept getting mm -hmm. extended and extended and extended. And, you know, I've said this before, along with the senator and, and assembly mcclellan is you know we're elected by the people for the people right mm -hmm. we're put in office mm -hmm. to do a job and that and that's yep. the same for the other side of the aisle as well we all were whether you're in the assembly mm -hmm. or, or the senate and you know i feel like it's an injustice i don't feel it. i mean it's, it's definitely an injustice to the people in the state of new jersey mm -hmm. all of them anyone who voted in in the last election uh to put us in office that it was taken out of their hands. Um, and, you know, I'm, I know for a fact that there are many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that feel that way as well. Mm. You know, um, like you said, it, it's really an injustice to the people to put us in office. And what I want to do uh, also, um, Assemblyman, I want to share uh, the fact that you were, you were participated in four committees, the community development, um, the education committee, and of course, you're uniquely qualified in that regard, um, being an educator, your career, your whole career, and then state and local government, which is very important and what you've served in. And what some people may not know, but they can read here is that you served uh, lower township as a councilman from 2013 to 2016, and then mayor from 2017 to 18. So you came uniquely, uniquely qualified for this assembly position. And as the Constitutional Republicans, we've stressed how important it is for people to have some sort of constitutional literacy and some intellectual rigor when it comes to understanding the purpose of government and how government works. And of course, you have all those uniquely, um, you have all those prerequisites. Yeah, and you know, there's also, when, when we were growing up, we had civics classes and uh, government. Yes. You know, uh, U.S. government classes and okay, we lost the assemblyman. I'm sure we'll be right back. With uh, here we go. It's just the fact that we that that that, that teachers aren't having time to teach the the the, the crucial. Uh, because they're busy being stuck, mandated teaching things that really aren't a school issue that, that should be taught at home or, you know, through social groups outside of school. Um, and that that's that's an, that's a problem. I mean, I remember you remember the old I'm um, just a bill on Capitol Hill, the schoolhouse rock. I mean, <laughs> even when you watch, you know, the, the uh, weekend cartoons, it, it was at least you got some education out of it. Um, if you ask a, 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 a college bound senior what an assemblyman does, most of them don't even know what an assemblyman does in the state legislature or a senator for that matter. So, or the three branches of government for that matter. So um, that's something we need to fix moving forward. And we really need to educate our youth in what government's all about, especially, you know, they, 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 they stress these college kids and, and high school kids that are 18, Go out and vote, 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 which is great. Everyone should vote because that's your right. Right. It also mm -hmm. understand what the heck's going on in this country. And you should understand your three branches of government and what they stand for before you even go out and vote. Otherwise, you know, it, it's like, um, it, you know, if I've never seen a basketball game before and I didn't even know the sport and I'm going to go throw, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars on, on, a, on the Philadelphia 76ers or whatever team and right. bet on a game when I don't even know the rules of the game. Uh, that's a problem, you know? Yeah. There's no question. And we talk, you know, that we talk uh, the constitutional Republicans about an educated electorate, how important it is for them to know uh, what the purpose of government is. Uh, most people think that government is uh, the Democrats believe the government is to help special, uh, give special rights and privileges to their constituents. Whereas as Republicans, 
and what you're doing and what uh, Michael Tust and uh, Antoine are doing is you're representing all the people, not just the people who vote for you, not just the Republicans that vote for you in LD1, you're representing all the people. And the idea with the, the, the political theory of the founding was that the government was there to protect the person, number one, that's the physical protection of the person from crime and from injustice, and then to protect their property, which in this case would be our money that we earn and the, and the property that we buy and the real estate that we have or whatever it is that we buy um, with our money. And that is the essential part of government. And that is what uh, you and uh, your team have focused on, whereas the Democrats are only interested in supporting those who vote for them. I mean, that is con contrary to the founding uh, uh, political theory. Absolutely. And I can tell you this, when you call the LD1 office, they don't ask you uh, if you're Democrat or Republican or independent. They ask you what your issue is and we help them. And we've helped thousands of constituents with unemployment. Uh, with yep. At the time, the MVC, Motor Vehicle Commission, because we used to call it the DMV. Uh, we helped get that open. and But at the time, they weren't open. And if, if they were, they were only serving you for one or the other of, of their um, what they're there for, which is either licensing or registrations. Well, now we got them back open and they're doing both of those services. But up to that point, like I said, if a person calls with a problem, um, you know, whatever it is, we, we don't answer the phone, legislative district one office. What, you know, what party are you? No, we right. serve every, you know, and that's, right. that's uh, you know, that that's the most important thing. It, it doesn't matter when, once you're in office, you're there to, to, to uh, represent everyone, whether they voted for you or not, like you said. That's exactly right. And I wanted to also, um... Uh, share um, some of your legislative uh, con uh, accomplishments, sponsored bills um, with the audience. And this is why it's so important that uh, you're reelected along with uh, Mr. McClellan and Mr. Testa. And uh, we see uh, the primary sponsors. And this is one that I thought was important, extends period. That's A4165, your primary sponsor sponsor extends period in which student athletes are required to receive physical examination before participation in school sponsored athletic activities during 2021 school year and of course you are uniquely qualified to uh, propose such a, a legislation and uh, tell tell us a little bit about uh, what was the impetus behind that well this was very important because at the time, yeah it was it was right when the pandemic hit um there were people going to, you know, the, the uh, doctor's offices were overwhelmed with COVID. And, you know, mm -hmm. again, at the beginning of the, of, of the pandemic or, or somewhat near the beginning. And, you know, you have to, in the state of New Jersey, pretty much every state, you have to have a updated physical in order to compete in, in an athletic, uh, on an athletic team in, in high school. And what was happening mm -hmm. is, you know, had to get their physicals re re-updated and and it was they were had to wait months sometimes uh to see a doctor to even do it and um right i was fortunate to, to get this bill passed and uh it basically grandfathered if you had a physical already from the year before it extended it six months which worked out great because by six months later you know obviously the the traffic in in uh doctor's offices the pandemic was still around but it wasn't as uh severe as it was um and uh at that point they um you know kids were able to to uh continue to um participate where they would have some kids would not have been able to participate in, in a in a season just because they, they didn't get their physical updated so that's that was, right and then it and then, and then, of course, the Sunderman uh, primary sponsor for uh, A4187, which authorized elective surgeries and evasive procedures to be performed during coronavirus disease 2019 emergency. This was very, very just legislation because, of course, the restrictions affected people who may not have had COVID, but may have had cancer um, uh, predicaments or they may have had uh, uh, kidney failure and they would need to be uh, I would need to be addressed every day as they. Uh, as they go and perform procedures to keep them alive. A lot of this was affected, but this legislation, again, very, very just in uh, uh, giving everyone equal protection. Yeah, and I mean, we've heard heartbreaking stories. I'm sure we all have, but especially our office, because that's, you know, we're, we're sometimes we're the last line that they can, you know, the last 
their last grasp for help uh, and the last gasp for help. But, uh, you know, when they can't get through to the state to get things done, but to, to hear people in such a bad way at such a bad time. And, and it was bad enough that there were people suffering or on hospice and couldn't, couldn't see their, their own parents or couldn't have funeral services or, you know, mm. you know, someone's dying in a hospital or, or has a serious Tragic. and they can't even get in to visit or, or, or hold their hand or, or spend time with them um, in their last moments. And it, it was, I'll tell you what it was heartbreaking. Tragic. It certainly was. And, uh, I, that hit home with our family. Um, we had a loved one who uh, we weren't able to uh, be in contact with. And it's very difficult because, as you know, uh, Assemblyman, the, the family are the primary caretakers and lovers of that individual. And they have that individual's best uh, interest at heart. Whereas, uh, of course, our, uh, the medical professionals and so forth do an outstanding job. Um, it's not quite the same as actually having a, a relative there. Uh, monitoring and being involved with the whole process, working with the medical professionals to help that individual out, their loved ones. So very, very good point. Also I want to stress the importance of uh, uh, A5619 uh, that you proposed the establishing certain requirements for social media websites con concerning okay. content moderation practices. Talk a little bit about that and how important that was. Well, it's it's called our constitution. Like you, you know better right. than any. And um, to, to see the, you know, your rights, some individuals have their rights stripped away just because, mm. uh, you know, those social media sites or media outlets uh, don't agree with what they have to say. Um, mm -hmm. That wasn't their place to do that. And, uh, you know, look, not everyone's going to agree with everything I say, and that's fine. Um, but. I should be able to say, and we, should, we can have a discussion afterwards. And, and I, I would you know, present the same respect to, to those people that I don't agree with. And, and um, that's why we're the United States of America. And, you know, that's why we became the United States of America. So we could have these freedoms. Outstanding legislation is so I'm thank you so much for that. And also AJR 152 and AJR 188. Uh, designating Emergency Preparedness Month for the month of September, recognizing how important our first responders are, and then designating March 31st of each year for New Jersey COVID First Responders Memorial Day. Uh, another very good, uh, rec two very, very just uh, recognitions and uh, very, very important that uh, you were leading in those designations. Well, and, and again, that's, that's uh, really a no brainer, but we had to, you know, put it up there because it, it, you know, we were the ones that decided to do that. But I mean, and look, that, that's a bipartisan thing. I'm, I'm sure everybody, you know, it's not Republican or Democrat. I mean, we all, we all, you know, respect and, and are, are grateful for the work that was done all the time, but especially during these last two years, yes. you know, it's they've put themselves in harm's way to help others. And anytime you do that, I mean, that's God's work, you know. That's right. And uh, it's so very, very important that we all um, appreciate uh, those who put the, their own lively. They're, they're really sacrificing their own natural rights of life and liberty to uh, to be able to care for others. But to some I want to direct the people's attention as they go to the website, njassemblygop.com, Simonson slash Simonson. And a fine video is made, uh, one that I really appreciated and loved. And of course, we're going to talk a little bit about why you and I are both Frederick Douglass Republicans. And um, you'll have to see, uh, you'll have to watch this video. Of course, it's only 323, but it gives a great uh, insight into the assemblyman. It's something uh, you should, uh, I would ask the audience to share with others. And there's, uh, there's Eric there, right there. And right, and right, right away, you're, you're mentioning, you, you know, you're not necessarily, you're not a politician, but you are a representative. And that's what's so important for people to understand. But uh, assemblyman, we could not uh, finish this discussion unless we talk a little bit about our hero and I was thinking earlier today, Assemblyman, that um, I really believe that um, um, Frederick Douglass uh, expounded probably more Republican principles uh, directly and succinctly 
more so than even Abraham Lincoln. And uh, we want to talk a little bit more about uh, Frederick Douglass. And here's one quote that you're uh, um, very familiar with. Of course, you're in the education business. And he said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And My isn't that quote. the truth? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's what we're talking about, Ed, educating uh, children when they're younger uh, the correct way and letting them make their own choices as they get older. Um, but I agree with you as far as Frederick Douglass advice. I mean, you know already, and, and we share this, but I, I am a, a huge uh, fan. Uh, I've been down, if you ever get a chance, down in um, uh, Maryland, there's the uh, Frederick yeah. Banneker Museum. Uh, I got it. Oh, actually, yeah. when I was there, I got to speak to the the curator and and the um, one of the guys that that started that whole museum. And we we did a lot like it in Cape May here, where I'm from, and in my own church, which is the Harriet Tubman Museum. But uh, yeah, Frederick Douglass. I mean, not only that, when, when you when you study his trials and tribulations and what he went through in a lifetime, um, you know experience is is bliss i mean experience is everything in life and you know i think it was i think it was john dewey that said education is life and it is every day you learn something new and you know there's there's those that learn from it and make themselves better and there's those that don't choose to learn from it and and keep hitting the same stumbling blocks over and over again and uh Frederick Douglass educated himself and, and, you know, every experience he had made him stronger and wiser as he got older and as he went through life and he learned so much and was able to navigate some of the crazy, you know, times that he went through and what he became. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially people don't realize, you know, he was like a Martin Luther King junior but back in in those times when there was, was still slavery and things he he you know propelled himself through his like i said his learning and his you know just perpetual learning and making himself smarter and wiser by learning from different experiences that he became an icon then which it, it, you know it isn't the same as now i mean you know look we always have to make ourselves better and improve um, human relations, but back then for him to, to get where he got during those times is just a tribute to, to his character. And it's, it's amazing. Right. It is. And of course you were instrumental along with the uh, Simleman McClellan and uh, Testa in getting the Harriet Tubman museum uh, established down there outstanding. And of course, Harriet Tubman was a proud Republican and look what, uh, our, uh, Great Frederick Douglass said, he said, I am a Republican, a black dyed and wool Republican and never intend to belong to any other party than the party of freedom and progress. And that's the same enthusiasm every Republican should have. And Frederick Douglass typified that. But John, you know what else he did? He also criticized the Republican Party when it needed to be criticized. And that's that, right. Another part of his great greatness was he wasn't afraid to criticize his own party for to make it a better to to make it a better party and now you know god forbid in, in the senate or the house of representatives where you know a, a democrat you know refutes anything from their own side they're 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 an outcast and they're you know they, they want to string them up and it's uh you know mm -hmm. like i said that just goes again. He he was years ahead of his time, <laughs> but yes. the fact that guys like you and I are still sitting here talking about it and 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 uh, carrying on his his legacy uh, just speaks to what a great great individual he was. And here's another quote to Assemblyman. Of course, you're you're so right in uh, in what you're expounding, and that's why the Constitutional Republic is the New Jersey Constitutional Republic is we really believe that we are the ancestors. Uh, that we are the progenitors of Frederick Douglass, and we keep his um, spirit alive as we do with Lincoln and Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner and Booker T. Washington, as, who is another gentleman that we will talk a lot about. But Frederick Douglass um, was, was very critical, and he was critical when criticism needed to, be, um, needed to be said. And that's what we, the Constitutional Republicans, take pride in doing as well. But here's another quote, uh, some of them, and he said, where justice is denied, 
where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. And that's easy describing the mentality of the Democratic Party and their constituents right there in that quote. And right here today. I mean, that quote is as live as alive today. As it yes, was it is. And, you know, John, real quick. I mean, the other thing is, you know, unfortunately, with social justice and all these things that have come about and, and I get it, mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to have some great mentors that that taught me a lot, but, you know, when you, Frederick Douglass, you know, not just Frederick Douglass, but when you, when you learn about human beings like Frederick Douglass, you really take mm-hmm. the color race out of it because That's right. they, he was an incredible human. Now you could say he's an incredible black American, which he was, but in all, he was just a great American. Um, yes. You know, Abraham was a great American and the relationship that those Abraham Lincoln, they both helped each other become the men they were because they, they took oh, they constructive did. criticism from each other and uh, they, they were they were brothers and they didn't always agree. And, um, you know, and so often I'll be out and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'll be out with uh, Assembly McClellan and Senator Testawill till he could tell you. And, and people just assume, like, what are you doing with these guys? You're, you're not a Republican just because of the color of the skin. <laughs> And, I, and it, you know, the <laughs> ignorance of people Terrible. that don't know anything about the Republican Party because it, was, right. it was, you know, it was the, the party of the African-Americans for so many years. Yes. And I, yes. think, I think that pen, pendulum is swinging back. I mean, I think, you know, people are starting to realize, um, you know, whatever color or, or wherever they come from, if they're legal immigrants, hopefully legal immigrants, um, you know, the history of the United States and, you know, it isn't all, it isn't all rosy, but, but again, back to my point, you learn as you go and this country has yes. grown the last 200 plus years and, and we've gotten better and, uh, you know, we're going to have setbacks, which I believe we're having right now. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm confident I'm an optimist. We'll get through it. And, uh, you know, I believe what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, that's right. And uh, I just want to touch on a couple of more quotes, uh, assembling while I have you real quickly. And this this quote provides the impetus uh, behind the uh, protection bill for freedom of speech on social media that uh, you proposed and sponsored. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, quote, liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. That of all rights is the dread of tyrants. It is the right for which first of all strike down. And that's precisely what you did with the, with the, with your proposal. Right. And again, you know, that, that, that quote of his is just as, just as real today as it was when he said, that's what is so amazing about him as a human being. I mean, he was so far ahead of his, he could, you know, it's almost foreshadowing the future, but you know, and listen, it just goes to show you they were dealing with the same type of things back then, obviously, you know, in different variations, but uh, or different varieties even. But, you know, unfortunately, we're still dealing with some of the same things. That's why I've got to just keep keeping up the fight, the good fight and, uh, you know, making sure that that we stay sh- steadfast in our Constitution and our values and our beliefs as Republicans. That's right. And Assemblyman, listen to this. Tell me if this doesn't apply to today. And Frederick Douglass said, quote, there is no Negro problem. The problem is whether the American people have loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution, unquote. Yep. And, and again, you can't say it any better. It, you know, all men are created equal, right? Amen. But, but they, Amen. they weren't treated equal until well even even once you know obviously slavery was abolished it's they still weren't treated equal and and in some cases they're still not and that's unfortunately that's that's a human uh defect but i think mm-hmm. for the most part we we try every day to uh to you know basically do the you know practice the golden rule and that is you know do unto others as you would have done to you and and uh 
you know, treat, treat people with respect, just like you want to be treated with respect. And that goes for, you know, whatever gender you are, color you are, race you are, uh, religion you are. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's all about mutual respect as human beings and God's people. That's right, Assemblyman. And we'll finish up with a quote that really provides a purpose or even a mission statement to the New Jersey Constitutional Republican and the Constitutional Republican uh, movement. Here's what Frederick Douglass said, quote, the 4th of July is the great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in the instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and whatever cost. Is that inspirational or what? Absolutely. And, and how quickly we forget sometimes. Right? I mean. Yes like like the times we're living in right now exactly so we see uh, we just did a quick uh, synopsis of some great quotes from uh, our great mentor and as i said earlier uh, assemblyman uh, frederick Douglass probably articulated more uh, succinct and profound republican principles than any other human being ever and that's why we're so encouraged uh, to uh, teach the republican heritage the initial principles are a Republican Party, and I know that you're uh, right there um, participating and leading the way for us. Well, again, I, I appreciate you having me on. Um, he, you know, we could talk about this all day. And I, I was, you know, I, I do a lot of audio, audio books, and I, I um, just because I could do it while I ride my bike when, in, the, in the spare time, which is very little during this campaign season, but um, while I exercise, I like to listen to, um, and I, and I, I, I listen to nonfiction and I've, I've read, you know, numerous books, almost maybe all of his autobiographies, uh, some biographies. And also, um, there's a great book called giants, which is about the whole relationship and how, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass first met and how their lives intertwined and how they, their relationship formed the way, the way that it did. And, uh, just some great, some great, um, you know, documentation, thank, thank God, uh, from so long ago that was well documented that we can still learn and, and like you pull up quotes that are still meaningful to this very day. Right. And I just happened to have this close by hand, uh, Simon, this is, of course, uh, Frederick Douglass. And uh, David Blight did an outstanding job with this book. It's a great book. There's a lot of information in it. One of my favorites. I actually hope to have uh, Mr. Blight join us uh, someday. Maybe what we'll do is we'll have a three-way conversation. I'll enjoy have you involved with that. I did, uh, and of course, you know, we can't pay enough homage to Frederick Douglass and how important he is to us. I did want to uh, very quickly uh, just move in a different direction because I know that uh, you and I are both very... Uh, you're an accomplished mus musician. I had <laughs> hoped to be, but never fell through with it. Uh, but we certainly um, have some great uh, admiration for many of the uh, people uh, that uh, have come along and some of the artists that uh, we both revere. And of course, here's one of them right here, uh, Elvis Costello and the attractions. And uh, you have to know, and of course, there's the, there's my, my, what my, um, in my estimation, one of the best albums ever um, is uh, Armed Forces. Is it, uh, we're trying to get it up there. There it is there. Uh, there's there's the album, of course, the third album. The first five or six albums were incredible. That's phenomenal. Assemblyman yeah. by, but where they were, and they just got better and better and better. And uh, I have to tell you a little story. You know, uh, Bruce Thomas, his bass player, The Attractions, was a hero of mine. I started pattering, uh, pattering my bass playing after him. And I actually had the opportunity to shake hands with him during the Imperial Bedroom Tour up in New York and Forest Hills, which was a great uh, honor. I bypassed Elvis and went right to Bruce. I think Elvis was a little surprised. <laughs> but uh, Bruce Thomas is, is one of my great uh, heroes, as well as Elvis Costello. And uh, I think that if you and I had lived close to 
together. If I had lived down there in Lower Township or you were up here in Shalik, I guarantee we would have been playing music together because it was right around the same time, I think, that uh, you, going you to a lot and of I. Sure. And, and oh, yeah. yeah we, would, it's we, we would have been attached to the hip, I'm sure. You, you, uh, it's funny you brought that up. So I never met Bruce Thomas, but I did meet Pete Thomas. He was playing drums oh, uh, for Graham drummer. Parker for a while. Yes. And got to speak to him several times. And here's one, a guy I actually played with, uh, open for when he was in a band called The Health and Happiness Show, who was our producer, James Maestro, who is still on tour, I think, with Ian Hunter and has played with the Jayhawks. But James is our longtime, produced all four of our albums and has played on some of our albums. James is a great guy, but his bass player at the time was Graham Maybe from Joe Jackson's band. So I got no, to be he's another great bass player. With Graham and Graham, I mean, you listen to those bass lines back on the yeah, look oh. sharp, absolutely look sharp, look sharp with great bass yeah. lines. That's like the story to our lives, right? That, that soundtrack to our life, look sharp. It our, is all those, um, right? But yeah, it's uh, I actually I just downloaded Elvis Costello's latest album. It's he did it all in French, so I you know I didn't, <laughs> didn't get a lot of it, but uh. He's an artist. What can I say? And he's he's uh, always always doing something different and exploring. And and God bless him. Well, listen, I really look forward to uh, getting together with you, Simon. We can talk more music. We could talk about. I want to talk about Andy Partridge and XTC with you, and I want to talk about the Edge and Bono a little bit. Uh, but uh, it sure is great to uh, have you join us. And I encourage all the voters of uh, LD1, Republicans, Independents, and those. Um, rational thinking Democrats to get out there and make sure you're voting for Assemblyman McClellan, Assemblyman Simonson, and State Senator Test, our LD1 Republican team. They had a great um, first term, and we want to keep them there to uh, properly and justly represent the rights of the people of LD1. Amen. Thank you, John. God bless and Godspeed. And uh, the next time I'm on, we'll do a full music segment. How's that? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll, I'll back yeah, you up. I'll sing right. harmonies and back up. <laughs> awesome. Great, Assemblyman. Thank you so much. Please like and share the video, everyone, and we will see you again. Remember, we have to finish with what Lincoln said, liberty to all. Thank you. And get out and vote. Red. That's right. Vote, <laughs> vote, vote. 100% Republican turnout on November 2nd. 100%. Awesome. See you, John. Thanks again. Thank you. Take care, Eric. Bye-bye.